Two more days. For many, this election season has been filled with many emotions, and I think mostly negative. Anger, fear, discouragement, worry. And of course, behind all these emotions and intensifying them is the pandemic. And what happens on Tuesday or when the votes are finally counted? Will these negative emotions change? For some, I think they will. For others, maybe not. We all like to replace all these negative emotions, whatever their cause, by this emotion, by rejoicing with an indescribable and glorious joy. Most of us would say that's asking an awful lot. But again, I remind you, these words were written to people who were Christians, who felt themselves aliens in a foreign country, in exiles, as it were, even though it was their own country. And they were suffering various trials, and Peter says they were undergoing, undergoing fiery ordeal. And yet, they can rejoice with that indescribable and glorious joy. And we can as well. They rejoiced in a living hope. God has given us, Peter writes, a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith until it's all revealed in the last time. Living hope. I love that. That phrase, a living hope. John Brown, not the John Brown of Harper's Ferry, but another John Brown from the 1800s, uh, talked about that living hope. I, I read what he had to say, and it's so happy to go. It's a living hope, not only in opposition to dead hope, but to an opposition to dying hopes. There are hopes that we hold on to sometimes because we're foolish and they die and they're dying uh, sometimes we realize that that's a foolish thing to hope for and we let it die and then there's other hopes people just hold on to and they die when they don't many hopes are not only dying he says but lying hopes anything that is not founded in the revelation of god what God has promised is a lie. And too often people die with those lying hopes. There's only one hope that makes us right with God, that gives us life with a capital L, a life that will remain that's a living hope. And it is living because it is based on the most extraordinary world shaking event in all of history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How could that ever happen? Someone who is dead be raised to life again with a, a glorious body. That's what makes this a living hope. That's what Peter says here. God has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. <coughs> And into an inheritance. We have an inheritance because of that that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. I like that those series of adjectives as well. Imperishable. It's not going to die. In fact, it's going to come more alive. It doesn't die when we die. Paul one of his letters says, athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable reef, but we can imperishable. It's undefiled. It's not stained. It's not tarnished. It has no downsides. It's, it's just a wonderful inheritance. Undefiled, imperishable, unfading. It doesn't grow old. 
doesn't fade like a picked flower. That's that's really what he's saying here. The, the Greek word is amaranth, which evidently was a flower that quickly revived when you put it in water. It's unfading. It's kept in heaven. That's a perfect tense. I've mentioned that before. I don't ever like to bore people to say Greek. One thing I've forgotten most of is. But a perfect tense is something you always notice in Greek because it's something that happened in the past and yet it's continuing to go on. It's kept in heaven. It happened. It's stored there. It's safe there. And it's still safe there. And it will be safe there. When, when Hebrew people uh, would talk about something secure, they, they would often say it exists in heaven. And we've done the same thing. I, I remember, maybe it's not used anymore, but theirs is a marriage made in heaven. That means, boy, it's solid. It's secure. It's kept in heaven. And not only is it kept, but we're kept. That's what Peter says next. We're protected by the power of God through faith. We're protected. We've got a military force around us to protect us. We have this living hope that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven, and we're kept for it. That's what we rejoice. That's what those folks rejoice. That living hope, no matter what we're going through. And even though we're going through tough times, and they were going through much worse, we rejoice even in that. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you've had to suffer various trials. It's so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Our rejoicing is not a denial of the hurt of the pain, of the suffering. In this you rejoice in the suffering because you know that God doesn't waste anything. God doesn't allow things to happen that don't have any meaning at all. There are three elements to what God is perhaps doing in suffering. Uh, some people call it a moral one, a mystical one, an eschatological one. That means something that at the end makes sense. It's moral, it's enhancing our faith, it's making us a, a stronger character. I know it's not an easy way to get a, a strong character, but sometimes we need that. It's mystical in that the scriptures talk about the fact that when we, we go through things and don't deny Christ, praise him through it, that somehow we're sharing in his suffering. Now, of course, we know he died once for all, yes, but Paul talks about it. That I've shared in Christ's suffering. When I'm doing something for him and it hurts, or when I'm very witness to him and it hurt, somehow I share it. And, and people rejoice in the scriptures and, and later saying, I suffered for Christ. There's a mystical element. And of course, there's an es eschatological element. In other words, it's going to end. It's in a little while. It will be gone. And when we get the glory, it will be the praise and glory and honor of him. I remember years ago reading a book by Edith Schaefer called Affliction. And in that she has this imagery of, of two museums in heaven. One is filled with people who have, who have gone into suffering and terrible times and God delivered them up here on earth and healed them. And they are, they are trophies to God's great healing power. And we've all seen that happen and we're all grateful for it. We pray for it. And then there's another museum filled with people who weren't saved out of any of that. But they bore witness to their faith through it. And both of them give praise and honor and glory to our Lord. Yeah, it's a little while. Paul says the same thing. We don't lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day, this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we don't look at things seen, but things unseen. It's, it's a scale with the eternal weight of glory so much greater than the light momentary affliction. 
So we rejoice even, even in our trials, Peter says. And then finally, most importantly, I think we rejoice in our living relationship with God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we've been given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You've been chosen and destined by God the Father, sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. We rejoice because we have a relationship with a living God right now. God's personal. I think that's so important. He's not the great unmoved mover. He's not way out there somewhere. He's personal. God is personal. God is love. Here, God is merciful, full of mercy. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Father. That's personal. He's not just the Lord, He's our Lord. That's personal. The Holy Spirit makes him personal to you and to me. We're chosen by the Father, Peter says. He knew us before we were ever formed in our mother's womb. He destined us. He had a plan and a purpose for you and for me. You're that special. You were redeemed at the cost of the blood of the Son. That's how personal it is. You're made right with God by His Spirit. Personally at work. Even though you haven't seen Him, you love Him. Even though you don't see Him now, you believe in Him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. It's true, we haven't seen Him. Don't you wish you had? There's Thomas, you know. Thomas said, unless I see Him, unless I can put my fingers in those wounds on his wrist where he was hung from the cross. Let's I can thrust my hand into the, where the spear went into his side. I, I won't believe it. Jesus uh, saw it. My Lord and my God. And then Jesus said, Beloved, you're, you're blessed by seeing me, but more blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. And that's us. Someday we will see that's what the Apostle John says in 1 John. Beloved, we're God's children now, but we will be, hasn't been revealed. But we need to know this, that when he's revealed, we'll be like him and we'll see him as he is. I like a lot of the hymns of Fanny Crosby. They're so personal. Fanny Crosby was blind almost from birth. But she wrote this. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washing his blood. Sounds like she's quoting 1 Peter there. Jesus is mine. I can say I love him now. Of course, Peter also has here that we were sanctified by the spirit to be obedient to Jesus. Our disobedience separates us from him and from joy. That's why David's great prayer in Psalm 51, when he had sinned against Uriah, taken his wife Bathsheba, he needed to repent. And he prayed, restore to me again the joy of your salvation. He had lost it. He needed it back. And make me willing to obey you. He had it. And Jesus made that clear that we want his joy, we have to do what he wants us to do. John 15, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I've said these things to you so that my joy, his joy, may be in you, that indescribable joy, and that your joy may be full, complete joy. Even in 2020, in a heck of a year, may we rejoice with an indescribable, glorious joy.